Okay, perfect. So I'm Benoît Lemo. I'm from uh, France, from the University of Rennes 1. And today I'm in charge of introducing the Adam Smith seminar, which is a pleasure, uh, uh, of course. And uh, today we have a presentation by Alain Marciano and Stefano Duguera. I, I'm not sure whether he's there already and if he's uh, presenting, but it's about the cost of treating strangers as yourself, cooperation, exploitation, and the Samaritan's Dilemma. And uh, I should say that it is a pleasure for me to present that, uh, to introduce that presentation uh, for, for several reasons. First, um, well, it's been a while that I didn't meet Alain Marciano. Uh, I don't know if you remember Alain, but I, I met you at the EPCS conference in Durham a long time ago, uh, where we had a lot of fun. And you know, it's that time where we could go to conferences. Anyway, uh, Alain is a um, professor at Montpellier University. His research relates to law and economics. Uh, for that reason, he's also the co editor of uh, the European Journal of Law and Economics, and as well, the co editor of the Encyclo Encyclopedia of Law and Economics. So let me know, uh, Alain, if I'm wrong, because in that case, it means that you need to update your Vita on the internet because uh, all that information is coming from your website. Uh, I also have the pleasure to introduce Stefano, who is a researcher at uh, Torino at the Center for Employment Studies. And he's also a postdoc researcher at the University of Torino and uh, his uh, research, uh, from what I understood, relates to work organization, interactions among agents and social preferences. Well, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to introduce uh, his presentation as well, because actually uh, my university and the University of Torino uh, have an international agreement, and we have uh, each year the pleasure to welcome students from that university in a degree in public economics and public finance. So that's uh, quite nice to, to see your work. A third reason for which I'm glad to introduce that seminar is, of course, the topic, which is quite interesting because uh, Samaritan's Dilemma applies to many situations, as you might know. Uh, well, I'm not specialized in the field, so I will try to introduce the topic from what I know, but of course, feel free to correct me or to complete what I will say. But, uh, well, in a broader sense, uh, that dilemma was introduced by Buchanan in the 70s, and it's some kind of moral hazard problem. For Buchanan, uh, well, maybe it's not that efficient, according to him, to help people because at some point some agents could abuse of the situation and ask for more help. And uh, so Buchanan was asking whether it was efficient or, or not to help people. And this situation uh, can apply to many fields, actually. And you can find uh, many examples in the, in the literature. I have some in mind, for instance, uh, you know, when the World Bank or nonprofit agencies try to help uh, developing countries in that case, uh, they try to, to provide assistance, but we know also that those countries still have unstable economies, and at some point, some uh, researchers ask whether it is actually efficient to help those countries. Another example is uh, for us uh, in academia, uh, whether to improve the marks of students, because if we do so, we know that maybe some other students will ask for higher marks as well, uh, which could well lead to the wrong incentives, of course. And another example that I have in mind is at home, when you are helping your children with their homework. And well, you know, you, you try to be uh, you try to help them, but uh, at some point it's almost you who are doing the homework, and uh, clearly there will be lacking of autonomy and uh, 
uh, at some point uh, you are losing also the, the incentives for them. So anyway, there are pl plenty of situations where uh, that dilemma applies and Stefano and Alain, from what I understood, will address that topic from a specific perspective. They will uh, look at those situations where you have heterogeneous morality or behavior, if you to simplify, and how those uh, heterogeneous moralities will uh, affect the decision of agents uh, when they interact in, in the context of a uh, San, uh, uh, Samaritan's dilemma. So um, actually I'm very glad to hear what you have to say about it uh, because uh, I ran an experiment one or two years ago. We just submitted the, the paper and uh, in, in this lab experiment we show that the morality of people actually depends on others' uh, action and others' Morality. It's an experiment about dishonesty, and we show that when people are informed about others' dishonesty, they actually uh, change their own behavior. And for that reason, I, I think I think it is quite interesting to hear what you have to say uh, about that as well. Uh, I think it that was my introduction. Um, I guess you have 45 minutes or one hour for your presentation and then there will be some time for discussion and questions. So thank you Alain and Stefano for your presentation and of course I will try to ask relevant questions at the end of your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you Benoit. So I guess that it's my turn to start presenting the papers. Yes, I've known a lot of people who are here for are attending this uh, this online seminar for many many years so it's a pleasure to see you and yes Benoit I remember very well this uh, conference in uh, in uh, Durham so uh, we start with a very basic elementary point of departure the fact that we uh, as individuals we interact with a lot of people and uh, there are two mainly two uh, categories of people we interact with, the people we know and the people we do not know. So the friends, family members, acquaintances, colleagues, that is all the people with whom we have frequent and repeated interactions. So we know what these people, who these people are, uh, is we know how uh, they will react to uh, our actions. And we interact with people we don't know or the people we call strangers in the paper. And with these persons, we don't have repeated interactions. We have only one short interactions. Therefore, uh, we um, do not know all, uh, what will be their actions. So in this paper, we are really interested in the interactions with uh, these uh, uh, strangers. This means that we are, uh, to, we can say that, and this is what we are doing in the paper, we can say that we are analyzing interactions uh, between individuals who belong to different groups. Um, so the, the behavioral assumption we start with uh, about these uh, strangers or these people from different groups is that uh, uh, when we belong to a group, we have the same degree of concern with for the members of the group than the others. So we all have the same degree of concern in uh, one group. We uh, to we could say that we have the same degree of morality, the same degree of altruism, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, concepts. Uh, but the fact is that we don't have the same degree of concern for others with strangers. So we, when we interact with the people uh, that we know, we have the same degree of concerns as these people. When we interact with strangers, we have different degrees of concern, we have de different degrees of morality. Therefore, analyzing interactions between people 
uh, between strangers means that we are analyzing interactions between individuals with different degrees of concern for others. So this is what we do in this paper. We analyze the outcome of one-shot interactions because it's interactions with strangers, one-shot interactions between individuals who have different degrees of concern for others. Uh, as I said here, we, uh, we assume that concern for others means or is the synonym, synonymous or sorry, synonymous of morality or altruism. Uh, as you will see in the, in the, in the following slides, the, we model this altruism as a weight that is given to the utility or to the payoff of the uh, other player. So. Uh, someone who is selfish only cares for his, himself or herself, therefore his utility depends only on his payoffs and someone who is concerned by the welfare of others, someone who is altruistic, um, is uh, has a uh, utility that depends on his payoffs and also on the payoffs of the uh, other individuals. Uh, so uh, I will uh, present the model soon, so maybe it will be clearer then. Uh, there is another assumption which is very interesting uh, and that relates to what Benoit said in this uh, introduction. We assume here that uh, individuals are, we could say, victim of a kind of moral illusion. The meaning is that individuals always behave uh, I should have written the things differently, but individuals, who, uh, yes, moral individuals always behave morally. And immoral individuals or egoistic, selfish individuals always behave immorally. So this is a bit different from what you said, Benoit, in the sense in the, 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 the experiment you mentioned, in the sense that here uh, egoism or altruism does not depend on the altruism of others. Uh, we assume that one individual is moral, therefore he behaves morally. Uh, it, to a certain extent, we could say that this individual does not learn, or maybe um, it's too difficult for him to change his moral beliefs because it's uh, uh, part of him, therefore it's, uh, this morality is not going to change when the other individuals change their behaviors. So this is something that is uh, really profound in the behavior, in the utilities of the, of the individuals. So what we do in this paper is we use a game theoretical model. Uh, players, individuals belong to, to two different groups. Uh, each group is morally homogeneous, but the two groups are morally heterogeneous. And uh, we analyze the interactions, which are random interactions between people from the two groups. And we start from a situation in which we have a one-shot prisoner's dilemma. And then we see, we analyze the impact, the impact of altruism on this one shot prisoner's dilemma. So the, the, the purpose of the paper, the object of the paper is to study how oh, altruism, morality, concern for others is going to affect the outcome of a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, the main result, as Benoit said in the introduction, the main result that we reach in the, in the paper is relates to the Samaritan's dilemma, which is indeed something that uh, at least in economics, is uh, associated with a paper that uh, James Buchanan published in 1975, but that was written uh, a bit earlier than 1975, and uh, in which uh, Buchanan explains that when a Samaritan plays uh, a game against um, a recipient that Buchanan calls a parasite, when the Samaritan plays a game against a parasite, then the Samaritan is trapped in a dilemma. The dilemma is that the Samaritan uh, has to face 
uh, either of the two uh, situations. Or the, the first situation, the Samaritan is behaves altruistically, then the consequence is that the parasite is, as Buchanan says, exploited, which means that the Samaritan gives some money to the parasite and the parasite doesn't recipro reciprocate, doesn't make any effort to uh, reciprocate the altruism of the Samaritan. And the other uh, possibility for the Samaritan is not to behave altruistically, but then he suffers from cost because the Samaritan be, being an altruist uh, individual uh, has to suffer a cost if he cannot uh, behave um, altruistically. Therefore, the trap is the following, either you are exploited or you are not altruistic. So altruism for Buchanan in that situation uh, leads to uh, a very uh, dramatic uh, situation, the exploitation of Samaritans. Um, what we show in the, uh, in the paper is that, yes, this is the first result that we put forward. Yes, uh, altruistics, altruists uh, who interact with egoists is uh, the individuals who have the highest degree of concern for others are indeed trapped in a dilemma. Either a prisoner's dilemma or a Samaritan's dilemma. So altruists have only one choice. Either the, uh, they, the, they face someone who does not cooperate with them and they do not cooperate, or if they cooperate because they behave altruistically, the others do not uh, reciprocate and therefore do not behave altruistically. And the, the, what we show too in this paper is that this situation is evolutionary stable. So um, to a certain extent, we generalize and we endogenize the Samaritan's dilemma. Uh, uh, in Buchanan's paper and in the literature, most of the time, the Samaritan's dilemma, the origin, uh, origins of the dilemma are not studied uh, and it's not analyzed in those terms. So I think that one of the, the contributions of this paper is precisely to show that uh, the Samaritan's dilemma does exist. But, and this is a second result, we also show that the Samaritan's dilemma, and this is where we differ from Buchanan, the Samaritan's dilemma is not actually not uh, that bad. Uh, there is some exploitation, yes, but exploitation improves the welfare of the two players. So we reach this somehow um, paradoxical situation, not so much paradoxical, but uh, <laughs> At this point, so Stefano will not uh, contradict me, but at this point, we, we have a little disagreement on how to interpret the result. So uh, we, still, we are still discussing that uh, between us. So the conclusion, one of the conclusions is that the parasite gains from exploitation because it receives some money and does not do nothing in exchange. But what we show also is that from the perspective of the Samaritan, in subjective terms, the Samaritan gains, gains, sorry, the Samaritan gains from being exploited. Uh, I will discuss that later, but it means that the Samaritan prefers to be exploited than not to be exploited. Uh, how does this relate to the literature? So, in fact, this literature on the Samaritan's Dilemma, there is a lot of literature on the Samaritan's Dilemma, yes, and uh, part of this literature, the, the part to which we refer in this paper, is actually uh, closely related to Baker's Rotten Key Theorem, so that Baker put forward in 1974. So, as you can see, it's more, more or less when Buchanan put, brought, wrote his own article. Um, so, and the rotten kid theorem is uh, the reverse or the opposite of the Samaritan's dilemma, because when the rotten kid theorem says that 
when the, there is an altruistic head of a family, this altruistic, this head of a family leads the other members of the family to uh, cooperate. So in that case, what Becker's, uh, what Becker said, what Becker's theorem said is that non-reciprocal altruism, so the head of the family is an altruistic individual, the other members of the family are egoist, but the non-reciprocal altruism of the head of the family generates, generates altruistic behavior from the other uh, family members, including those who are egoist. Uh, I put quote marks uh, uh, around family because the family is not necessarily a father or mother, but it's a, a small group of people. And there is a, a, a literature more recent about that. Uh, um, we have two, I put two, two references here saying that uh, the reverse of uh, Becker's Rottenkey theorem. Non-reciprocal altruism destroys altruism. Therefore, the conclusion is that when we have uh, altruistic individuals in a group of egoists, then even the altruists tend to become uh, egoists, or rather the altruists tend to behave uh, egoist egoistically. So to a, to a certain extent, what we show is that um, this is not so true. So what we show is that um, uh, Baker was wrong, or the Rottenkey theorem, theorem does not apply. When there is a, an altruistic head of a family, then the other members do not cooperate. But we show also that non-reciprocal altruism does not destroy altruism because the Samaritan gains, as I said earlier, the Samaritan gains from being uh, trapped in the dilemma. There is a, a also a relationship, a connection with the biology and bioeconomics and this literature on altruism. It's uh, minor, but the, the bioeconomics and uh, biology uh, demonstrated that uh, altruism can prevail if there is no uh, reciprocity. This is also s part of what we are saying, uh, but it's, uh, I'm not going to insist on that because it's not the most important part of, of the paper. So, as I said, to summarize uh, our findings, altru here, altru altruism is non reciprocal, non-reciprocal altruism does not generate altruism, but does not destroy it. As I uh, just said, we showed that there is a Samaritan's dilemma and we generalize or we endogenize the Samaritan's uh, dilemma. As Benoit said, it's uh, uh, pervasive. Indeed, what happens in, under the assumptions that we use in this paper, that it, uh, it occurs that uh, we show that the Samaritan's dilemma occurs as wh whenever altruism is non-reciprocal and as soon as uh, altruism uh, reaches uh, a certain uh, threshold. But we show that it's not so much of a problem because uh, at least in subjective terms, uh, it's, uh, it can be perceived as something uh, beneficial for, uh, from, uh, for both uh, parties. So let's start with the, with the model. Uh, we have, so as I mentioned in the introduction, we have two groups of individuals. Uh, each uh, individual has two strategies. It's a very simple uh, game uh, theoretic setting with uh, uh, the uh, it's a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, I don't think that there is really uh, uh, any need to enter into much details at this uh, stage of the uh, discussion or the presentation. Uh, then uh, the, the, we have the, the payoffs. The payoffs are the objective payoffs of, uh, that each individual uh, receives. Uh, uh, when they choose one strategy and the other uh, player uh, chooses another uh, strategy. Uh, uh, altruism or morality or concern for others here is measured by uh, alpha and beta. 
So alpha and beta are the degrees of altruism of the members of uh, group one and group two, group two respectively. So this is so they are uh, between zero and one. And this is what I mentioned earlier. So the utility of uh, individuals of group one depends on the payoffs uh, that the individual of group one receives and the payoffs of the other uh, individual, uh, the individual from group two uh, receives. So uh, we see uh, that uh, alpha and beta measures the weight given to the payoffs of uh, each, uh, each group. Therefore, if we have this kind of uh, uh, utility function, the, the, the game, the, the payoffs of the game and the game uh, changes. So the, 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 when the two player cooperates, the, 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 the outcome of the game remain, uh, the out outco outcome of the game remains the same uh, when the two players defect, the outcome of the game remains the same. But of course, the game changes when the, the two players do not choose the same strategy. So it's not very uh, complicated. It's just uh, linear utility functions. It's not very difficult. But uh, we have to... Um, we, we can derive we we from this very uh, simple setting we are going to derive a few uh, conclusions just before uh, going to the conclusions and the results or the, the analysis uh, let me uh, mention that uh, there are two uh, possible parametrizations uh, depending on the values of t p r and e so that we we assume that there are two cases. The first is when T minus P is greater than R minus E. We claim here that they, uh, there is a strong temptation to defect uh, because uh, in the sense or because the player gains more when uh, he or she defects uh, unilaterally than by uh, cooperating. And uh, when the T minus P is uh, smaller than R minus E, then there's a weak temptation to defect because the player gains uh, less by uh, defecting unilaterally than by cooperating. Um, this, is, this is going to play uh, uh, an important role in the following, uh, in the last part of the analysis. Okay, uh, now, we uh, introduce this. Uh, we introduce these uh, variables. So x and y. X is the share of compliers in group one, and uh, so one minus x is the share. So this is not a minus. Uh, x is the share of compliers in group one, and one minus x is a share of defectors in group one y is a share of compliers in group two and one minus y is a share of defectors in group two the net gain of uh, the, that results from cooperation is the difference between these two utilities e uh, could be equal to one and two depending on the group uh, in which uh, each individual is Therefore, the equations of uh, the, the payoffs such that the, 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 the net gain from uh, cooperation is equal uh, to zero is given by these, these equations. So these equations describe the curves along which the, 
utility of cooperating minus the, two uti uh, the utility of defecting for an individual of one group depend, uh, is equal to zero. So uh, again, this is not uh, really uh, technically complicated, but it's uh, just uh, so uh, it's important to have these equations uh, in mind. Um, then uh, we reason, as I said, the, the result we find uh, in this paper is uh, evolutionary stable. So we show that the semi-tense dilemma is evolutionary stable. Therefore, we introduce, we reason in dynamic terms. So we use a uh, 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 replicator dynamics approach. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the dynamics of the system uh, are given by these two equations where um, these are the derivatives of x and y, uh, um, the time derivatives of x and y. Okay, so we have this, we have these two equations. And then from these two equations, we can infer that the, uh, there are four uh, stationary states, actually five uh, stable equilibriums in the system. So you can, uh, you can, uh, we can represent the system in, in a square, in a unit square. And the four uh, summits of the square are uh, stationary states. So, and um, uh, there is another internal stable equilibrium at the intersections, uh, so the intersection of the equations of the null clients that uh, uh, um, of which I gave the equations uh, earlier. So what are these, uh, these, uh, these, so what do these five equilibria allow us to conclude? So this is the first proposition that we make in the paper. So this proposition one is the first set of results that we have in the paper. And this proposition one has four aspects. The first two aspects uh, relate to uh, the well, homogeneous populations. When we have homogeneous populations, either all cooperators or all defectors. So the first result is when the what we call cooperation. So this is a situation when we have a stationary state in which all uh, the players cooperate. I think it is, should be cooperate here uh, and not uh, defect. So the we have a stationary state in which all the players find uh, cooperation attractive. So not defect, but cooperation. We have a stationary state in which all the players find cooperation attractive if alpha is smaller than this value and beta smaller than this value which simply means that when the players have a rather small or weak degree of altruism, weak or small other regarding or weak other regarding preferences or small degree of altruism, in other words, they are rather selfish, then we have a stationary state uh, which is, um, well, actually, I think I, I made the mistake. So it's defection here. So Stefano uh, will be able to confirm that. So it's defection here and uh, defection here. So when the players are, sorry, sorry for the confusion. Uh, when the players are rather selfish, we have uh, a defection. The second result we find, so here it's cooperation. When the degree of altruism is smaller than this value, 
where uh, the, there is a stationary state in which all the players uh, cooperate. So actually, what I mean is the following. Uh, when the population is homogeneous, when altruism is uh, too uh, weak or too low, then all the players defect. Uh, when altruism is greater than a certain th threshold, then all the players cooperate. So we have two uh, stationary uh, state, two stationary equilibria. When uh, one, when the players are rather selfish, defection. One, when the players are rather altruistic, cooperation. But we see that the interesting point here is that cooperation, cooper cooperation will prevail even if altruism is not pure. So there is no need to have purely altruistic people with alpha and beta equal to one to cooperate. And defection will prevail if altruism is small. So there is no need to have alpha and beta equal to zero to have defection. So we can have defection even if the players are altruistic. But they are not uh, altruistic enough to guarantee cooperation. And then at the other uh, end of the spectrum, there is no need for the players to be entirely, purely, totally altruistic to, to cooperate. So defection and cooperation depends on altruism, but we can have defection in a world in which people are altruistic. And we can have cooperation in a world in which people are partly egoistic. So there, is, there are two other uh, situations, two other uh, elements, two other parts in this proposition. Another one, which is uh, exploitation. So we have a stationary state, a stationary state in which there is exploitation. And this uh, is the situation when the players uh, in group one, because we take group one as a, a focal uh, group but it's uh, reverse if we um, take the group two as the, the reference group. So when individuals of group one have strong other regarding preferences and individuals of group two have weak other regarding preferences, then the people from group one, the cooperators from group one are exploited by the defectors uh, uh, from group two. So in, we me, we, it means that uh, when one player of group one cooperates the and uh, interacts a player from group two who is going to defect there is uh, this situation is stable and this corresponds to the samaritan's dilemma and this is the situation of exploitation there is also a, a situation of uh, predation and we have so predation is a reverse so the the reverse you see the the values of alpha and beta are the same but the the superior and inferior are different here so this equilibrium is exactly the same except that it's predation so it's a reverse predation is the uh, the reverse of uh, exploitation so the as I said earlier, and uh, if we take group two, group two as a focal point, as a focal group, then predation and exploitation are reversed. So it means that, uh, for instance, exploitation means, uh, I don't know if I put a slide. Uh, yes, uh, so the, the, we have the explanation here. These two results mean that when the population is heterogeneous, it means, it means that when uh, cooperators interact with defectors. The, 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 the players who are uh, altruistic, when the players who are altruistic have a sufficiently strong other regarding preferences, and when egoists have uh, sufficiently weak other regarding preferences, then the altruistic players cooperate and the uh, egoist uh, defect always. So this is... Uh, uh, the Samaritan's dilemma, and this is uh, um, 
an evolutionary stable uh, situation. Therefore, when we have one-shot interactions in a, a, an heterogeneous population and uh, someone from the group of cooperators interact with someone from the group of defectors, then we have a Samaritan's dilemma. Therefore, we show that the Samaritan's dilemma, uh, we endogenize the origins of the Samaritan's dilemma. We show that the Samaritan's dilemma exists as soon as one of the players is sufficiently altruistic and the other player is not enough uh, altruistic or su sufficiently egoist. Uh, which of the two equilibriums will prevail? Uh, this depends on the, 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 what I mentioned earlier, the, the, the weak and strong temptation to defect. So depending on the value of alpha and beta, we show that uh, cooperator, cooperators, uh, so if we have this condition, and if we have this condition, then uh, cooperation or and defection will be uh, the uh, equilibrium one of the two depending on the values uh, and exploitation and predation will be the equilibrium if we have this condition and that uh, condition so if we have weak temptation and this order between alpha and beta then we have cooperation or defection if we have strong temptation to defect and this uh, values between alpha and beta, we show that exploitation or predation will, uh, will be uh, the uh, stable uh, equilibrium. Which simply means beyond the, 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 the numbers or the variables here, it simply means that uh, we have um, situations in which exploitation and predation can be uh, a stable equilibrium. Um, then, uh, to move to the second proposition, uh, we show that when the defection equilibrium is attractive, we show that this equilibrium is always less efficient than cooperation and predation. And we show that defection is less efficient than exploitation if alpha is smaller than this value. Uh, we also show that when cooperation is attractive, cooperation is less efficient than exploitation if alpha is greater than this value. So there is always a value of alpha for which exploitation is more efficient. And when exploitation is the attractive equilibrium, we show that it's less efficient than predation if alpha is smaller than uh, one half. And uh, we also show that it's always more efficient than the defection equilibrium. And we uh, finally, the fourth result of this second proposition is that when predation is attractive, it is always more efficient than the other equilibrium. Therefore, from this, uh, I hope that it, I was uh, clear enough to uh, um, make this conclusion uh, obvious. From what I said earlier, the second proposition means that Samaritans prefer being exploited than uh, interacting with parasites who cooperate. In other words, uh, a Samaritan will always prefer to interact with a, with a parasite, parasite than with uh, a parasite who cooperates. So to a certain extent, it means that um, 
if we have a population in which there are Samaritans and the population in which there are parasites, uh, it's not uh, going to improve the welfare of the, this population if we oblige the parasites to cooperate. Because if we oblige the parasites to cooperate, it decreases the welfare of uh, parasites and it decreases the welfare of Samaritans. So this is what I um, uh, meant earlier um, when I said that we have a discussion with Stefano. So one of the, the, the question is, is it a good or bad situation? Uh, what it means is that the, the obvious result is that uh, parasites need Samaritans. Of course, if there are no longer Samaritans, uh, parasites will be obliged to, to work and uh, won't be able to behave as parasites any, anymore. But the reverse is also true. Samaritans need parasites. This is this was the meaning of uh, the, 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 the Samaritans dilemma for Buchanan, is that uh, Samaritans, if Samaritans can be, can, cannot behave as Samaritans, then they lose some uh, uh, utility, therefore their welfare decreases. So both categories, need the uh, each other to a certain extent the, this is uh, this is an interpretation that i try to develop in another paper but it's uh, it's not so it's consistent with one uh, interpretation that was uh, put forward by uh, elias khalil uh, on uh, about becker's altruism um, there is a form of masochism in uh, becker's altruism uh because it means that the altruist prefer the in Baker's model the altruist prefer uh, prefers to see the utility of others increase than to see his own utility increases so the the, the, the Samaritan the altruist the head of a family prefers to decrease his utility to increase the utility of others to sacrifice his own utility to increase the utility of others and therefore, by inc by decreasing its utility, by to a certain extent, it means that by decreasing its, its utility and increasing the utility of the other, the increase in the utility of the parasite compensates decrease of utility of the Samaritan, and therefore it's uh, Pareto improving. The question is: uh, Is it really uh, a good? Uh, situation do we have to could, should we encourage or prevent this kind of situation this is not so clear among uh, and uh, we are trying to find uh, to, to Stefano and I are trying to find an answer to this uh, to this um, puzzle so for, for what uh, to to conclude I don't know if I, if I was too long or not but to conclude I would say that uh, so uh, three uh, major uh, points in the paper that we make. First, we endogenize the origin of the Samaritan's dilemma. So um, by using these uh, very simple forms of uh, linear forms of uh, utility functions, we find we explain that as soon as one player is uh, sufficiently altruistic and the other the other is sufficiently uh, egoist, then there is always a Samaritan's dilemma. We also show that this situation is evolutionary stable and we show that it does not depend. So of course, the Samaritan's dilemma, as Benoit said in his introduction, the Samaritan's dilemma is something that has been studied and it has been shown that the Samaritan's dilemma occurs under this and that uh, condition and uh, what we show in the in this paper is that we don't need any uh, sophisticated assumption about the population. So we don't have to assume that there are some rich people and poor people, some uh, um, I don't know uh, any, what kind of assumption we could make, but we don't have to make any assumption about the, the people. We just have to make an assumption about the, uh, the their degree of altruism, which is different. And uh, the third result, as I insisted on that, is that the Samaritan's dilemma is welfare and utility and enhancing 
at least in subjective terms, uh, which uh, which is the, the, the which is the, the, actually the problem, the subjective terms. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and I now look forward to your questions.